All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've heard all the evidence in the case. So what I'm going to do is pass out instructions of the law to you. And I'm going to read the instructions to you. And what we will do is we'll, this will take about maybe 20 to 30 minutes at most. So we'll be recessing at about 5 o'clock today. I'll have you come back at 9.30 tomorrow morning. We'll hear the attorney's closing arguments. Uh, and then the case will be given to you. So that will roughly be before the uh, lunch hour. And then we'll have you begin deliberating. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have uh, lunch ordered in for you all so that you can have lunch while you're deliberating. And I'll probably have a few other instructions to give you tomorrow after the closing arguments. So, David, you can pass the during this trial, please pay attention to the instructions that I am about to give you. Introduction to homicide. In this case, Delanor de Mercy is accused of first-degree murder with a firearm. Murder in the first degree includes the lesser crimes of murder in the second degree and manslaughter, all of which are unlawful. A killing that is excusable or was committed by the use of justifiable deadly force is lawful. If you find James D. Peoples was killed by Delanor de Mercy, you will then consider the circumstances surrounding the killing and deciding if the killing was first degree murder, murder in the second degree, or manslaughter, or whether the killing was excusable or resulted from justifiable use of deadly force. Justifiable homicide. The killing of a human being is justifiable homicide and lawful if necessarily done while resisting an attempt to murder or commit a felony upon the defendant or to commit a felony in any dwelling house in which the defendant was at the time of the killing. Excusable homicide. The killing of a human being is excusable and therefore lawful under any one of the following three circumstances. One, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune and doing any lawful act by lawful means with usual ordinary caution and without any unlawful intent. Or two, when the killing occurs by accident and misfortune in the heat of passion upon any sudden and sufficient provocation. Or three, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat if a dangerous weapon is not used and the killing is not done in a cruel or unusual manner. A dangerous weapon is any weapon that, taking into account the manner in which it is used, is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. I now instruct you on the circumstances that must be proved before Delanor de Mercy may be found guilty of first degree murder with a firearm or any lesser included crime. Murder in the first degree. To prove the crime of first degree premeditated murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, James D. Peoples is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Delanor de Mercy. And three, there was a premeditated killing of James D. Peoples. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. The period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the killing. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. An issue in this case is whether Delanor de Mercy did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not act with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, A, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person, and B, a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control 
and would have been driven by a blind and unreasoning fury, and C, there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off, and D, a reasonable person would not have, co would not have cooled off before committing the act that caused death, and E, Delamore de Mercy was in fact so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that caused the death of James D. Peoples. If you have a reasonable doubt about whether the defendant acted with a premeditated design to kill because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should not find him guilty of first degree premeditated murder. When there are lesser included crimes or attempts, in considering the evidence, you should consider the possibility that although the evidence may not convince you that the defendant committed the main crime of which he is accused, there may be evidence that he committed other acts that would constitute a lesser included crime. Therefore, if you decide that the main accusation has not been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, you will next need to decide if the defendant is guilty of any lesser included crime. The lesser crimes indicated in the definition of first degree murder with a firearm are second degree murder and manslaughter. Murder in the second degree. To prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, James D. Peoples is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Delamore de Mercy. And three, there was an unlawful killing of James D. Peoples by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that, one, a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another, and two, is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent, and three, is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict of second-degree murder, it is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. If you find the defendant guilty of the crime of second-degree murder, then you must further determine beyond a reasonable doubt if, in the course of committing the second-degree murder, the defendant carried a firearm. An act is in the course of committing the second-degree murder if it occurs in an attempt to commit second-degree murder or in flight after the attempt or commission. If you find that the defendant carried a firearm in the course of committing the second-degree murder, you should find him guilty of second-degree murder with a firearm. If you find that Delano de Mercy committed second-degree murder with a firearm, and you also find, beyond a reasonable doubt, that during the commission of the crime, he actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with a firearm with actual possession of the firearm. If you find that Delano de Mercy committed second-degree murder with a firearm, and you also find, beyond a reasonable doubt, that during the commission of the crime, he discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with a firearm with discharge of the firearm. If you find that Delano de Mercy committed second-degree murder, and you also find, beyond a reasonable doubt, that during the commission of the crime, he discharged a firearm, and in doing so, caused death or great bodily harm to James D. Peoples, you should find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder with a discharge of a firearm, causing death or great bodily harm. A firearm is defined as any weapon, including a starter gun, which will, is designed to, or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive, the frame or receiver of any such weapon, any firearm muffler or firearm silencer, any destructive device, or any machine gun. The term firearm does not include an antique firearm unless the antique firearm is used in the commission of a crime. To actually possess a firearm means that the defendant either A, carried a firearm on his person, or B, had a firearm within immediate physical reach with ready access with the intent to use the firearm during the commission of the crime. An issue in this case is whether Delano de Mercy did not have a depraved mind with regard, I'm sorry, without regard for human life because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. In order to find that the defendant did not have a depraved mind without regard for human life, 
because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation. A, there must have been a sudden event that would have suspended the exercise of judgment in an ordinary reasonable person. And B, a reasonable person would have lost normal self-control and would have been driven by blind and unreasonable fury. And C, there was not a reasonable amount of time for a reasonable person to cool off. And D, a reasonable person would not have cooled off before committing the act that caused death. And E, Delano de Mercy was, in fact, so provoked and did not cool off before he committed the act that caused the death of James D. Peoples. If you have a reasonable doubt about whether the defendant had a depraved mind without regard for human life, because he acted in the heat of passion based on adequate provocation, you should not find him guilty of second-degree murder. Manslaughter. To prove the crime of manslaughter, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, James D. Peoples is dead. Two, Delanor de Mercy intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of James D. Peoples. Every person has a duty to act reasonably toward others. If there is a violation of that duty, without any conscious intention to harm, that violation is negligence. The defendant cannot be guilty of manslaughter by committing a merely negligent act, or if the killing was either justifiable or excusable homicide, as I have previously instructed you. In order to convict of manslaughter by act, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to cause death only an intent to commit an act that was not merely negligent, justified, or excusable, and which caused death. The negligent act or omission must have been committed with an utter disregard for the safety of others. Culpable negligence is consciously dis doing an act or following a course of conduct that the defendant must have known or reasonably should have known was likely to cause death or great bodily injury. If you find the defendant guilty of the crime of manslaughter by act, then you must further determine beyond a reasonable doubt if, in the course of committing the manslaughter by act, the defendant carried, displayed, used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a firearm, deadly weapon, or any other weapon. An act is in the course of committing the manslaughter if it occurs in the commission of the crime of manslaughter or in flight after the commission. If you find that the defendant carried, displayed, used, threat to use, or attempted to use a deadly weapon or any other weapon in the course of committing the manslaughter, you should find him guilty of manslaughter with a weapon. The firearm is legally defined as any weapon, including a starter gun, which will, is designed to, or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive, the frame or receiver of any such weapon, any firearm muffler or firearm silencer, any destructive device, or any machine gun. A dangerous weapon is any weapon that, taking into account the manner in which it is used, is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. It is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant intended to use or was willing to use the weapon in furtherance of the manslaughter in order for a weapon to constitute a dangerous weapon. A weapon is defined to mean any object that could be used to cause death or inflict serious bodily harm. If you find that the defendant carried no firearm or weapon in the course of committing the manslaughter, but did commit the manslaughter, you should find him guilty only of manslaughter. Justifiable use of deadly force. It is a defense to the crime of first degree murder with a firearm or any lesser included offenses if the actions of Delano de Mercy constituted the justifiable use of deadly force. Deadly force means force likely to cause death or great bodily harm. Delano de Mercy was justified in using deadly force if he reasonably believed that such force was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. If Delano de Mercy was not otherwise engaged in criminal activity and was in a place he had a right to be, then he had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground. In deciding whether Delano de Mercy was justified in the use of deadly force, you must consider the circumstances by which he was surrounded at the time the force or threat of force was used. The danger need not have been actual. However, to justify the use or threatened use of deadly force, the appearance of danger must have been so real that a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed that the danger could be avoided only through the use of that force or threat of force. Based upon appearances, Delano de Mercy must have actually believed <coughs> that the danger was real. 
However, the defendant had no duty to retreat if he was not otherwise engaged in criminal activity and was in a place where he had a right to be. If you find that Delanor de Mercy, who because of threats or prior difficulties with James D. Peoples, had reasonable grounds to believe that he was in danger of death or great bodily harm at the hands of James D. Peoples, you may consider this fact in determining whether the actions of Delanor de Mercy were those of a reasonable person. If you find that at the time of the alleged first degree murder with a firearm, Delano de Mercy knew that James D. Peoples had committed an act of violence, you may consider that fact in determining whether Delano de Mercy reasonably believed it was necessary for him to use or threaten to use deadly force. If you find that James D. Peoples had a reputation of being a violent and dangerous person and that his reputation was known to Delano de Mercy, you may consider this fact in determining whether the actions of Delanor de Mercy were those of a reasonable person in dealing with an individual of that reputation. In considering the issue of self-defense, you may take into account the relative physical abilities and capacities of Delanor de Mercy and James D. Peebles. If in your consideration of the issue of self-defense, you had a reasonable doubt on the question of whether Delanor de Mercy was justified in the use of deadly force, you should find him not guilty. However, if, from the evidence, you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Delano de Mercy was not justified in the use of deadly force, you should find him guilty if all the elements of the charge have been proved. Plea of not guilty, reasonable doubt, and burden of proof. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. The presumption stays with the defendant as to each material allegation in the indictment through each stage of the trial, unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. To overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has the burden of proving the crime with which the defendant is charged was committed, and that the defendant is the person who committed the crime. The defendant is not required to present evidence or prove anything. Whenever the words reasonable doubt are used, you must consider the following. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt does not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or, if having a conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. It is to the evidence introduced in this trial, and to it alone, that you are to look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence, conflict in evidence, or the lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty. If you have no reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. Weighing the evidence. It is up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witnesses acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider are, one, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Two, did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Three, was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Four, did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Five, does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? Six, did the witness at some time, some other time, make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? And seven, has the witness been convicted of a felony? Whether the state has met its burden of proof does not depend upon the number of witnesses it has called or upon the number of exhibits it has offered, but instead upon the nature and quality of the evidence presented. The fact that a witness is employed in law enforcement does not mean that his or her testimony deserves more or less consideration than that of any other witness. Expert witnesses are like other witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert witness to give his or her opinion. However, in Expert's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe him or her to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. The defendant in this case has become a witness. 
you should apply the same rules to consideration of his testimony that you apply to the testimony of the other witnesses. It is entirely proper for a lawyer to talk to a witness about what testimony the witness would give if called to the courtroom. The witness should not be discredited by talking to a lawyer about his or her testimony. You may rely upon your own conclusion about the credibility of any witness. A juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence or the testimony of any witness. Defendant statements. A statement claimed to have been made by the defendant outside of court has been placed before you. Such a statement should always be considered with caution and be weighed with great care to make certain it was freely and voluntarily made. Therefore, you must determine from the evidence that the defendant's alleged statement was knowingly, voluntarily, and freely made. In making this determination, you should consider the total circumstances, including, but not limited to, one, whether the defendant made the statement, he had been threatened in order to get him to make it, and two, whether anyone had promised him anything in order to get him to make it. If you conclude the defendant's out-of-court statement was not freely and voluntarily made, you should disregard it. Rules for deliberation. These are some general rules that apply to your discussion. You must follow these rules in order to return a lawful verdict. One, you must follow the laws that is set out in these instructions. If you fail to follow the law, your verdict will be a miscarriage of justice. There is no reason for failing to follow the law in this case. All of us are depending upon you to make a wise and legal decision in this matter. Two, this case must be decided only upon the evidence that you have heard from the testimony of the witnesses and have seen in the form of the exhibits and evidence and these instructions. Three, this case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or are angry at anyone. Four, remember the lawyers are not on trial. Your feelings about them should not influence your decision in this case. Five, your duty is to determine if the defendant has been proved guilty or not in accordance with the law. It is the judge's job to determine a proper sentence if the defendant is found guilty. Six, whatever verdict you render must be unanimous. That is, each juror must agree to the same verdict. Seven, your verdict should not be influenced by feelings of prejudice, bias, or sympathy. Your verdict must be based on the evidence and on the law contained in these instructions. Cautionary instruction. Deciding a verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. Please disregard anything I may have said or done that made you think I prefer one verdict over another. Verdict. You may find the defendant guilty as charged in the indictment or guilty of such lesser included crime as the evidence may justify or not guilty. If you return a verdict of guilty, it should be for the highest offense which has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find that no offense has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, then of course your verdict must be not guilty. The verdict must be unanimous. That is, all of you must agree to the same verdict. Only one verdict may be returned as to the crime charged. The verdict must be in writing and for your convenience the necessary verdict form has been prepared for you. It is as follows. I have a two-page verdict form which is styled at the top, State of Florida v. Delano de Mercy, defendant. It's entitled Verdict and it states as follows. We, the jury, find as follows. We find the defendant. Following that, there's a blank. To the right of the blank, it says guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment. We don't have the form? No, you don't have the verdict form. I also want to give you all one verdict form for all of you to take back to the jury room. You will be taking these instructions back with you, but the verdict form you will not be taking back with you. Okay. So after the first blank that I told you about, the second blank reads as follows. Guilty of second-degree murder, a lesser included offense. If you find the defendant guilty of this offense, you must answer the following four questions. One, during the commission of this offense, did the defendant discharge a firearm that caused death or great bodily injury to James D. Peoples? That would be followed by two blanks, one with the word yes, one with the word no. You would check one of those off if you find that he is guilty of second-degree murder. Then you go on to the next number, which is during the commission of this offense, did the defendant discharge a firearm? That's followed by a blank with the word yes and a blank with the word no. Then you go down to the third interrogatory. It says during the commission of this offense, did the defendant actually possess a firearm? That's followed by a blank with the word yes and a blank with the word no. Turning to the second page of the verdict form, 
Number four says, during the commission of this offense, did the defendant carry, display, use, threaten to use, or attempted to use some type of weapon? That's followed by a blank with the word yes and a blank with the word no. And the next question is, or the next blank would be guilty of manslaughter, a lesser included offense. That's followed by, if you find the defendant guilty of this offense, you must answer the following question. One, during the commission of this offense, did the defendant carry, display, use, threaten to use, or attempt to use some type of weapon? That's followed by a blank with the word yes and a blank with the word no. You check off whichever you think is appropriate if you get to this, uh, this charge of manslaughter. Then that's followed by a blank with the words not guilty. And then it's followed by, so say we all, this blank day of December 2019 in West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida. Underneath that, there's a blank with jury four person signature underneath, you know, a blank where the jury four person who has that person would be would print it. <coughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> these are the instructions that I'm going to be sending back with you when you deliberate in, in paper format. Um, tomorrow at 9.30, I'm going to ask you to come back and the attorneys will be giving their closing arguments. And I'll have a few more instructions to give you, and then the case will be given to you for your deliberation. As I told you before, I think because of the time uh, where we'll be at the close of the closing arguments, I think what we'll do is we'll have lunch ordered at for you, and that will be delivered to you in the jury room so that you can continue to deliver and eat lunch so you don't have to take a break and come back. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to release you now. And I'm going to ask you, it's extremely important at this stage that you do not discuss this case amongst yourselves or with anyone else, including family members, friends, co-workers, anybody. You do not use your cell phones or any electronic device that you may have to look up anything about this case. Uh, don't listen to any television uh, news stories about the case, if there are any. Don't look at the paper. In fact, just stay away from the paper just in case it's in the paper. I don't want you to accidentally read any articles in the paper. Uh, and again, don't try to do any research. Don't look up anything on the internet. And with that being said, please have a safe trip home, and I will see you all tomorrow at 9.30. Thank you very much. Just leave your uh, jury instructions on the seats. Thank you. I'm not used to doing this. I think the only objection would be uh, preserving the state's request for the aggressor. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Anything else before we take a recess? Nothing from the state. All right. Um, I think we'll talk about how much time we have. So we'll see everybody at 9.30 then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.